I want to welcome everyone to this absolutely fascinating lecture that is happening today. We have been planning for this over a year and a half, and the pandemic kept delaying it. I am absolutely overjoyed that we have Professor Michael Silvestri with us, and I'm going to, you know, say a, a little bit about all the amazing things that he's done so far. Michael Silvestri is a professor of history at Clemson University, South Carolina. He is a specialist in modern British and Irish history, and his research focuses on transnational networks of individuals and ideas across the British Empire. Professor Silvestri is the author of two very important books, Ireland and India, Nationalism, Empire and Memory, which was published in 2009, and Policing Bengali Terrorism in India and the World, Imperial Intelligence and Revolutionary Nationalism, 1905 to 1939, which was published in 2019. He is also a co-author of a great textbook called Britain's in 1688, A Nation in the World. His current book project, tentatively titled, A Country That Has Served the World Well with Police, The Irish Policeman in the British Empire and Beyond, explores the Irish role in policing the British Empire in locales ranging from North America to the British Caribbean, to Southeast Asia, to Australasia in the 19th and the early 20th century. He examines how Irishmen conducted careers in the Imperial service, the position of the Irish within the racial hierarchies of the British Empire, the construction of communities of Irish men and women to the culture and society of the empire and how the Irish experience as Imperial policemen compared to their role as policemen beyond the empire's borders. Professor Silvestri's research has been funded by grants from the American Philosophical Society, from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and many other sources. He has been very productive during this pandemic, and he also has two essays forthcoming in two edited collections, A Global History of Irish Revolution and Ireland 1922, Independence, Partition, Civil War. I will now hand the meeting over to Professor Silvestri to start his lecture. Very warm welcome to you, Professor Silvestri. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mo, for that uh, for that very very warm and and generous uh, introduction, and uh, most of all for uh, for being my uh, my colleague at Clemson, and and also for uh, inviting uh, me up here today to, to speak to the South Asia Center. I'm very uh, very very happy to have this opportunity. Uh, thanks also to, uh, to to Sarah, Andrea, Tyler, and, uh, and Lauren for their their help. Let me uh, go ahead and but let's start uh, at the beginning for my talk today. Uh, I should say at the beginning, uh, I probably am not saying much about about sailors or uh, maritime workers, uh, more precisely, uh, 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 a lot more about spies about revolutionaries uh, and also about imperial intelligence officers uh, in the British Empire between the world wars. So I want to start with the image that appeared in my poster for the talk today. Uh, it's, it's actually the image I'd like to have used on the cover of my most recent book, uh, but for, for copyright reasons, I was not able. And it shows one of the final attempts by Bengali revolutionaries to carry out an assassination of a high colonial official, in this case, the governor of Bengal, Sir John Anderson. The photograph shows the aftermath of the attempt on his life, which took place at Lebon Racecourse at Darjeeling on the 8th of May, 1934. As Anderson stood in the governor's box to view the winner of the governor's cup, the highlight of the spring race season at Darjeeling, Two members of a revolutionary group known as the Sri Sangha, named Rabinda Banerjee and Bawani Bahatacharji, who had been seated in the stands near the governor's box in European clothing, took aim with their revolvers. Both men missed their target. One was wrestled down by the race starter as he steadied his arm on a railing. The second missed at point blank range and a jammed revolver prevented a second shot. The photograph shows one of the would-be assassins being carried away after the attempt by police and the governor's bodyguard. Anderson, to applause from the crowd, insisted the races continue and remained in the governor's box until the end of the day's event. I begin with this photograph not simply because it's such a striking image, a blur of movement in which the police hold back the race course's crowds, 
that perhaps the man with the umbrella on the left seems unaware of what has taken place, but also because it illustrates important facets of the Bengali revolutionary movement and British imperial intelligence that I wanna focus on in my talk today. On the one hand, the anti-colonial campaign of Yugantar, the Anushilan Samiti, and other Bengali revolutionary organizations that followed the 1905 partition of Bengal and continued into the 1930s was based in a single Indian province and largely limited to a specific social and religious group, the Bengali Hindu elite or Bahadrok, who made up the ranks of these gentlemanly terrorists to use Derba Ghosh's evocative term. At the same time, however, the Bengali revolutionaries form part of a larger global anti-colonial movement that Tim Harper has referred to as the Asian underground. And they are linked to networks of other nationalist, communist, and anti-colonial activists around the globe. While many live transnational lives, often seeking refuge beyond the boundaries of the British Empire, they maintained, linked with, they maintained links with revolutionaries in Bengal. Revolvers, the favored weapon of revolutionaries, such as the would-be assassins in Darjeeling, were procured by networks of Asian and sometimes European maritime workers. Easily concealable and lethal, repeating handguns enabled individual revolutionaries to pose a potent threat to colonial officials. Bringing larger scale shipments of arms to India was also a consistent goal of revolutionaries overseas. One of John Anderson's assailments, assailants, uh, Rabindra Banerjee of Dhaka district, was an unconventional example of the transnational lives of these revolutionaries. Banerjee, who had his capital sentence commuted by Anderson, left the revolutionary movement, studied engineering in Britain, served in the RAF during the Second World War, and in a development that must have been particularly satisfying to the devout Scottish governor, converted to Christianity. While the Bengali revolutionaries thus exemplified the global, as well as the local dimensions of anti-colonial movements, the imperial response to these gentlemanly terrorists was similarly transnational. A study of police intelligence and revolutionary nationalism in Bengal helps us to better understand not only the nature of colonial power in late colonial India, but also persistent and pronounced anxieties of the imperial insecurity state. It can help us to better grasp not only the nature of elite revolutionary activity in India, but networks of anti-colonial activists outside the Raj. The extensive intelligence and police operations against the Bengali revolutionaries illustrate how both imperial intelligence and forms of anti-colonial resistance designated as terrorism were an important feature of the interwar period. As we will see, intelligence officers from Bengal impacted intelligence and counterinsurgency work in the British Empire and the wider world, and contributed to a growing sense of British expertise in intelligence matters. John Anderson himself was an example of this intra-imperial movement of counter-terrorist and counter-insurgency expertise. Former Home Secretary in London and Under Secretary of State in Dublin Castle, Anderson drew extensively on his experience during the 1919-21 Irish War of Independence in his tenure as Governor of Bengal. His arrival in March 1932 led to renewed efforts to elicit the cooperation of the Indian and British military in the campaign against the revolutionaries, as I've discussed elsewhere. Today, however, I want to look at two figures from my research who illustrate the transnational nature of anti-colonial activism and imperial intelligence. The Latvian-born revolutionary Hugo Rothschis, although he, like many revolutionaries, had multiple aliases, including Hugo Espinosa, and the Anglo-Irish Imperial policeman, Sir Charles Tegart. Espinosa was one of the most eclectic characters in the global story of the Bengali revolutionary movement. He traveled in North America, Europe, and Asia in the 1910s and 1920s, and was subject to the surveillance of multiple imperial intelligence agencies. His revolutionary career illustrates how imperial authorities feared the intersection of diverse anti-colonial movements with the revolutionaries in Bengal. Indian police officer Charles Tegart served as both head of the Bengal Police Intelligence Branch and as police commissioner of Calcutta and was recognized as one of the foremost experts on terrorism in India, the title of his lecture to the Royal Empire Society in 1932. Cultivating a reputation as a wild Irishman, Tegart was renowned for his sang-froid in the face of multiple assassination attempts. 
his possibly apocryphal skills at disguise and undercover work, and for his brutal treatment of revolutionaries who came into his custody. When Tegart left on a special mission to reorganize the Palestine police in 1937, which I'll say a bit about later, the Imperial, uh, the Imperial press labeled him, quote, the most daring and courageous policeman in the world today, a brilliant detective and linguist, and an implacable and imperturbable enemy of anarchical terrorists. Though it is not clear that Espinosa and Tegart ever encountered each other, although they were both in Calcutta during the 1920s, they epitomized not only the global circulation of Indian revolutionaries, but also the mutually constitutive relationship between imperial intelligence officers and their subjects of surveillance and analysis. To use Tim Harper's phrase again, there was a quote, a symbiotic, often intimate relationship between international policing and anti-colonial underground. The one helped bring the other into existence. Global revolutionaries obsessively tried to forge connections to advance their struggles. The police obsessively looked to uncover connections in order to prove the existence of wider conspiracies and plots, unquote. It's not surprising, therefore, that most of what we can reconstruct about the anti-colonial career of Hugo Espinosa comes from imperial intelligence archives, or that Charles Tegar was a key figure in imperial surveillance of M.N. Roy, Bengali revolutionary nationalist turned founder of the Indian Communist Party during the 1920s, a figure who is also very important to Espinosa's story, as we'll see. Imperial authorities who liked to dissect and compartmentalize anti-colonial movements feared the intersection and alliance of anti-colonialists of diverse nations, social, ethnic, and religious backgrounds, and ideologies. The career of the revolutionary Hugo Espinosa is in many respects uh, illustrates these persistent imperial anxieties as his life was shaped by migration and characterized by kaleidoscopic shifting identities and affinities. He was born Hugo Rothschis in the port city of Libau, Latvia, at the time part of the Russian Empire in 1886. Espinosa's parents seemed to have separated when he was young, while his brother, so sorry, while his father, Leopold, and two of his sons emigrated to Boston, Hugo accompanied his mother to Vienna. The government of Bengal later described him as being raised there, and that is where the uh, family photograph is from. Although much is unknown about Espinosa's life, it is clear that he spoke German as well as English. In the 1920s, he taught both languages to students in Tokyo, and possibly Asian and other European languages as well. He traveled extensively in Europe and Asia, and by the end of the First World War, had become involved in some fashion in radical politics. It is not clear when or why he adopted the name Hugo Espinosa, although he was known variously as Hugo Rothschis, Hugo Rogers, and latterly, as we will see, as Abdur Rashid. Espinosa first came to the United States in 1904 and was naturalized as a US citizen in Boston two years later. By the beginning of the First World War, he had moved to New York City, living on St. Nicholas Avenue in Harlem and working as an architectural bronze worker. He had hoped to return to Europe in 1914, traveling to Italy for the purposes of health and study, as he wrote on his passport application. The First World War interrupted his plans, but by 1915, Espinosa had developed a new ambition to travel to India, where he hoped to pursue, in his own words, quote, oriental religious study, unquote. He requested an amendment to his passport, which had formerly only been endorsed for Italy, to allow him to undertake this journey with a friend via a steamship to Gibraltar. It's not certain whether Espinosa did in fact travel to India, and it seems likely that he did not, uh, as he continued to write about his ambition of visiting there. By 1917, he had switched residences in New York City and was working on the Lower East Side of Manhattan as a waiter at the Cafe Royal, described by the New Yorker magazine as, quote, the forum of the Jewish intelligentsia, unquote, a gathering place for the world of Yiddish-speaking theater, art, literature, and music, and also for socialist and radical political thinkers. Around this time, Espinosa seems to have been introduced to Indian revolutionary politics as well. By the end of the First World War, New York City had emerged as a center of anti-imperial activity, 
a nexus where different radical groups could converge and where in the words of one historian, quote, an all encompassing, an all encompassing colorblind opposition to British imperialism could take root and grow, unquote. Espinosa around this time shared an apartment with the prominent Punjabi nationalist, Lala Lajpat Rai, the founder of the Indian Home Rule League. Lajpat Rai founded alliances with other radicals, ranging from African-American activists, such as W.E.B. Du Bois, to Irish separatists. Through his relationship with Lajpat Rai, Espinosa became involved in what the U.S. State Department described as, quote unquote, intri intrigues with the prominent Irish-American lawyer and art collector John Quinn and his clerk, a Bengali student named Porendra Narayan Sinha. Quinn was a moderate nationalist, although he strongly condemned the executions of the leaders of the 1916 Easter Rising, and through his campaign for clemency for Roger Casement, he had connections to Irish separatist leaders in the United States. British intelligence noted that Sinha was in contact with the leaders of the wartime Indo-German conspiracy and had received German funds at some point. Perhaps introduced into Irish nationalist circles through his relationship with Quinn, Sinha also served as, quote, a link between Irish and Indian revolutionaries, unquote. As is probably clear by this point, much of what we know about Hugo Espinosa comes from British and some American intelligence sources. And some of the above information about both Espinosa and Sinha may in fact have come from John Quinn. Quinn, a casual informant for British intelligence uh, agency SIS, illustrates the complex and varied motivations of informers. At the same time as Quinn protested the execution of Irish rebel leaders and befriended nationalists such as Lajpat Rai, he condemned Irish separatists and other revolutionaries who opposed the Allied war effort, which seems to have been a reason why he was a regular visitor to the British consulate in New York City, where its wartime intelligence section was based. By the early 1920s, primarily through the reports of agents and informers, Espinosa had become well known to British imperial intelligence agencies, primarily through his connections to two of the most prominent members of the first generation of Bengali revolutionary nationalists, M. N. Roy and Rash Bihari Bose, the Bengali revolutionary and Pan-Asianist who had lived in exile in Japan following his role in the assassination attempt on the Viceroy, Lord Harding, in 1912. As his contact with anti-colonial activists grew, Espinosa seemed to epitomize the global threat posed by Bengali revolutionaries, as well as the interconnections between different movements. Described by the Intelligence Bureau of the Government of India as, quote, a German-Russian Jew, Espinosa also fit the colonial stereotype of foreign Semitic agitators stirring up communist revolution in India, and therefore a person to be watched closely. Indeed, even an obscure revolutionary such as Espinosa was a subject of imperial surveillance efforts. The small office in London, known as Indian Political Intelligence, or IPI, under its first director, John Wallinger, collected information on Indian anti-colonial activists worldwide from other British intelligence agencies and from a small number of agents in Europe, serving as a catch-all coordination of information about anything relating to India and to Indians within the empire. Some of Espinosa's correspondence with M. N. Roy was surreptitiously photographed by an unknown associate of Roy's who was working for IPI. One of his letters, written while Espinosa was in Japan and addressed to the post box to the Indian Communist Party in Zurich, Switzerland, was reproduced in full in IPI's, in IPI's report on the Indian Communist Party of the 22nd December 1922. Espinosa's letter is the portrait of a revolutionary who was forging connections with like-minded activists around the globe. He became part of what Tim Harper has characterized as, quote, the greatest missionary undertaking of the modern age, in which a generation of Moscow-trained communists returned to Asia and, quote, attempted by their words and example to awaken vast societies and set them in motion. It is not clear where Espinosa and Roy met uh, whether in New York City, Mexico, or Europe, but by 1922, they had a number of mutual friends and associates. Espinosa updated Roy in his correspondence with Indians in New York City, who were possibly affiliated with the Friends of Freedom for India, 
an organization whose leader at the time was another Bengali revolutionary named Salindranath Ghosh, and asked Ray for the address of someone who was possibly a Communist Party member in Mexico, noting that, quote, I also hear occasionally from friends in India. Espinosa's letter was also a portrait of a man on a journey of self-fashioning and self-discovery, a process shared by many revolutionaries. Espinosa had maintained his interest in Asian religions, and he wrote to Roy of his efforts to travel to Tibet in order to study Buddhism. To his great disappointment, China's ongoing civil conflict prevented him from reaching Tibet, although he was able to travel across much of China as far as Chongqing. And Espinosa's spiritual journey would continue to be an important part of his story as a revolutionary. India continued to be an important concern as well. Espinosa had hoped to travel onward from Tibet to India. He made another effort to visit the subcontinent. He had been invited to Calcutta by Abani Mukherjee, Roy's rival in the Indian Communist Movement, but these, were all, these plans were also thwarted when British officials refused to grant him a visa. Frustrated that no reason was given, he wrote to Roy, quote, of course, this is the attitude to be expected from hard-headed officials. Espinosa also sought to reassure Roy that he and Indians in, Indians in Japan continued to work for the cause of Indian self-government. And I quote, now I believe you have told me that there is no chance to go to India unless it is an independent India. I see that you are still doing your bit and I assure you that every one of us here is trying to improve the condition of the country through various ways, such as business, etc. cetera. And, and Espinosa went on to detail the activities of student organizations. Uh, he was affiliated with Indian student organizations he was affiliated with in Japan, uh, saying that our fund is small, nevertheless, our ambition is great. Through his association with Roy, Espinosa also had connections to communist revolutionaries in Europe, Asia, and the Americas. Through his relationship with Raj Bihari Bose, he became more deeply involved with Bengali revolutionaries. In early 1923, British consular official C.J. Davidson, an important source of intelligence on Indian revolutionaries in Japan in this period, observed that Bose enjoyed an intimate, revol sorry, an intimate relationship with Espinosa, who, quote, has been living in Tokyo for some time without any visible means of support and is almost certainly connected in some way with the Bolsheviks." Unquote. In the following year, Espinosa had returned to Shanghai where the director of the intelligence bureau reported that he was constantly mixing with two Punjabis named Harbaksh Singh and Jian Singh who were described as two of the leading agitators at Shanghai. Like Espinosa, Harbaksh Singh, described by the Singapore police as an ardent seditionist, had connections to Japan. In early 1923, he had opened a shop with a Japanese man that displayed photos of leaders of the Akali movement in chains and other nationalist images, which according to British intelligence, made a considerable impact on Sikh opinion in Shanghai. At the same time, British sources reported that Espinosa worked for, quote, the counter espionage department of the Soviet government. Most concerning to colonial authorities in Bengal, Espinosa by this point had become involved in plans to smuggle arms to revolutionaries there. Although like much about Hugo Espinosa's life, the nature of his, of his involvement with these clandestine arms shipments is not entirely clear. In 1922, Espinosa had written to M.N. Roy that he wished to, quote, start a business, import and export, the same as we had with you. For this reason, please send as much as you can spare. My friend will cooperate with me and make this a success." Unquote. Elsewhere, import-export served as a front for clandestine arms shippers, as was the case with a former Lascar named Henry Obed, who had settled in Hamburg. Obed's import-export firm dealt first in articles for semen and later the business of live animal import-export although he also assisted Laskars in obtaining arms for resale in India and helped recruit Indian seamen to attend meetings of a Bolshevik club organized by M.N. Roy in the early 1920s when he was in Germany. The government of Bengal wrote, uh, appropriately, that Espinosa played, quote, an important if obscure part in what they termed a formidable conspiracy to smuggle arms into India via East Asia in the mid-1920s. 
While in Shanghai in April 1924, Espinosa was reported to be in affluent circumstances and told Harbach Singh that, quote, he must be in India by the spring of the next year. In the following month, Espinosa, unable to obtain a passport, returned to Japan. He was admitted because Rajbahari Bose stated that he knew him personally and was prepared to stand guarantee for him. Before leaving Shanghai, Espinosa also told a British agent that he needed to consult with Bose about an alternate plan for arms smuggling, since an expected messenger from India had not materialized. In July and August of 1924, Indian intelligence officials became aware of large-scale seizures of arms on ships to Southeast Asia. In early July, for example, the SS Schlesen arrived at Colombo, but instead of machinery parts, was found to have a cargo of 100 sporting rifles, 288 automatic pistols, along with over 28,000 rounds of pistol ammunition. IPI, after examining relevant arm, arm smuggling files, saw these as part of a pattern of large consignments of arms shipped mostly from Hamburg through a Chinese agent to Asian destinations, particularly Hong Kong. The Bengal Police Intelligence Branch was convinced that Bengali revolutionaries were involved with the seized arms shipment at Colombo. A police source was reportedly told by Subhas Chandra Bose, who was often uh, implicated in revolutionary plots in this period, at least according to British intelligence, uh, that the arms seized form parts of shipments intended for revolutionaries in Bengal and for which he had sent 50,000 rupees to a foreign country. The source further reported that the arms would be sent first to Burma or China and smuggled from there to India. But it was allegedly told the source that the smugglers were concealing the arms in a country craft engaged in coastal trade, as well as hollowed out tree trunks imported by timber merchants. He added that the revolutionaries, quote, had recently successfully smuggled some false packing cases from Rangoon to Calcutta in order to see whether the customs authorities were alert. The Bengal Police Intelligence Branch and the Government of India's Intelligence Bureau both considered Espinosa to be an integral part of this conspiracy. And for reasons that once again are not entirely clear, he arrived in Calcutta on the 28th of September, 1924, although authorities were not aware of his presence until a month later. He was arrested and detained on November 8th under the Bengal Ordinance, shortly after Subhas Chandra Bose and 17 other nationalists were arrested on the same day in late October. Although family history held that Espinosa had simply aroused suspicions by asking, quote, too many questions of locals, the judges reviewing Espinosa's case concerned that he was a crucial figure in revolutionary arms smuggling networks. Papers in his possession included, quote, Bolshevik documents, which indicated that he was operating along propaganda lines. Espinosa was detained without trial for almost four years for inciting insurrection, as U.S. authorities later termed it. As Derma Ghosh and Joseph McQuaid have shown, a fundamental part of the colonial strategy to suppress revolutionary terrorism in Bengal in the interwar period was a normalized state of emergency, which allowed for extended detention without trial of suspected revolutionaries. Espinosa was the one Bolshevik among lists of hundreds of so-called criminals, anarchists, and revolutionary politicians held under the Bengal Ordinance and similar legislation during the 1920s. At the end of 1927, the government of Bengal began making arrangements to release Espinosa along with other revolutionary detainees. Colonial authorities faced the problem, however, of what to do with a Latvian-born revolutionary. It is considered most undesirable to set this man any free anywhere near Bengal, or indeed anywhere in India, the government of Bengal wrote, and the government of India will probably agree that it is inadvisable that she should go back to the Far East. Espinosa expressed a desire to return to America, where his father and his brothers resided, but it seemed unlikely that the United States would accept a communist revolutionary involved with international arms smuggling. The government of Bengal hoped that Espinosa's religious beliefs, which along with his anti-colonial ideology, along with his anti-colonial ideology, had shifted during his border crossing career. Uh, they'd hoped that this would provide a way to remove him from India. At the same time as Espinosa may have been an emissary of Comintern, he also maintained a deep interest in religion. He first read the Quran in a bookshop in Tokyo and was deeply moved by the first passage, the Al-Fatiha. 
While in detention in Bengal, he converted to Islam and adopted the name Abdul Rashid. Rashid further expressed a desire to visit Mecca, which formed the basis of a plan outlined by the government of Bengal. And I quote, failing permission to return to America, Abdul Rashid himself is willing to visit Mecca. He has been a devout Mohammedan, Sunni, ever since he first arrived in India. And to all appearances, he is sincere in his religion and fervent in his daily prayers. If the government of India have no objection and can secure the consent of the Hajjaz authorities, the government of Bengal proposed to send Abdul Rashid to Mecca, paying his expenses there and giving him a sum sufficient for about three months, by which time he will probably be able to find employment there or elsewhere." End quote. The government of India agreed that Rashid should be released, but at a time when Indian pilgrims on the Hajj had organized daily protests against the Indian government and shipping companies, the presence of a committed revolutionary in Arabia was most unwelcome. The Indian government just strongly attempt, uh, objected to any attempt to send him to the Hejaz, where he would be likeful, liable, in their words, to cause further trouble. Rashid was prevented from spending further time in prison when American authorities agreed in early 1928 to grant him a passport and leave to enter the country. This was possibly due to the intervention of Massachusetts Senator David I. Walsh, uh, earlier the first Irish Catholic governor of the state, a staunch anti-imperialist with whom the Ross Keith's family seems to have formed a friendship. His passport, under the name Hugo Rothschild, was valid for only two months and for a single journey to the United States, and he departed for Boston on the city of Salisbury. Even so, the government of India took steps to warn the governor general of the Sudan, the high commissioner of Egypt, and French authorities in Algeria to prevent Rashid from disembarking. And he arrived back in Boston on the 25th of April, 1928, without further incident. The Bengali revolutionaries with whom Espinosa associated were in common with their counterpart, counterparts elsewhere in Asia, eclectic in their inspirations. A revolutionary leaflet from the mid 1920s urged young Bengalis to quote, think of De Valera of Ireland, Lenin of Russia, Mazzini of Italy, Garibaldi, the Rajput heroes, and other heroes of the world. During the 1920s and early 1930s, however, Ireland occupied a special place in the insurrection, insurrectionary imagination of revolutionaries in Bengal, which culminated in efforts to restage the 1916 Easter Rising in the form of the Chittagong Armory Raid. Charles Tegart, however, represented a different aspect of the Irish imperial experience than the IRA commander Dan Breen, the tradition of Irish and particularly Anglo-Irish imperial service. The son of a Church of Ireland minister, Tegart was born in County Derry in the north of Ireland, but spent much of his childhood in Dunboyne, County Meath. He attended the Portora Royal School in Eskillen and later spent a year at Trinity College, Dublin, uh, before taking the Indian police exam in 1901. Throughout his three decades as an imperial policeman, Tegart's career was linked with intelligence work against Indian revolutionaries. In 1913, he was appointed to the newly established intelligence branch of the Bengal police, where he helped gather information that led to large-scale detentions and deportations of suspected revolutionaries under the 1915 Defense of India Act. In 1917, he served as one of the principal advisors to the Rowlett Committee, which was investigating revolutionary crime in India. Tegart was renowned among his police colleagues for his ability to manage Indian agents and informers, typically members of revolutionary groups who provided the bulk of information that led to the wide-scale detention of revolutionaries, as in the case of Espinosa, uh, and also the primary means through which colonial authorities sought to counter the movement. As an example of the scale of this enterprise, in 1932, the Bengal Police Intelligence Branch reported that they employed 853 agents who collectively accounted for almost 18,000 pages of information. Tegart was notorious among revolutionaries for the brutality of his interrogations and an example of how the use of torture and coercion formed part of the repertoire of tactics used to elicit confessions. A former Indian police colleague recalled that the Irishman's favorite interrogation technique was to fire a loaded revolver above a suspect's head and then place the gun next to his head before asking a question. 
Tegart's imperial reputation was nonetheless burnished by the fact that he survived multiple assassination attempts while remaining seemingly unflappable. Tegart, uh, Tegart insisted on taking his terrier dog with him everywhere in Calcutta, even though it marked him as a target. Intelligence officials such as Tegart created a new colonial ethnography of the Bengali terrorist, which both added to and drew upon the corpus of colonial ethnographies and similar collective threats to colonial rule in South Asia, such as thugs, dacoits, and criminal tribes. By the interwar period, they had emerged as experts on imperial policing and revolutionary terrorism, and such expertise was available for deployment outside India against other threats to the British Empire. Indeed, Tegart was but one example of a much larger circulation of police and intelligence officials around the British Empire in the years leading up to the Second World War. The lives of imperial intelligence officers and their efforts to thwart the plans of Bengali revolutionaries around the globe and employ their expertise in other colonial contexts illustrate what David Lambert and Alan Lester have referred to as the complex spatiality of empire and how its imperial networks connected, quote, multiple colonial metropolitan as well as extra imperial sites. Tegart was involved in these efforts to trace and monitor networks of anti-colonial revolutionaries during his almost six years in London from 1917 to 1923 as an assistant to J.A. Wallinger at the Office of Indian Political Intelligence. Most of his work involved Indian revolutionaries, but during this time, Tegart was also asked to apply his policing experience to the War of Independence in Ireland. In the summer of 1920, Tegart was recruited for service in Ireland along with another former Bengal police colleague named Godfrey Denham, who had been working for SAS in Southeast Asia, again, after carrying out some of the investigations into the uh, assassination attempt on Lord Harding in 1912. The Irish War of Independence was for both Republican insurgents and Crown forces, in large part, an intelligence war in which access to information was crucial to the outcome. Tegart and Denham arrived in Ireland at a time when the civil, military, and intelligence administration had been overhauled, and when the Irish Republican Army's campaign against the Irish police and British military had escalated significantly. The two, Be two Bengal police officers were recruited to organize and head a new London Secret Service Bureau, which was to be the cornerstone of a revamped British intelligence service in Ireland. The Bureau was to recruit Irishmen in Britain and send them to Ireland in agents, uh, equipped, wait for it, with secret ink in which to send their reports back to London. Many of the features of the War of Independence in which Tegart and Denham were confronted would have appeared familiar to them from their experience in Bengal. The extensive reliance on agents and informers in order to penetrate revolutionary groups, the brutal treatment meted out to revolutionary suspects, and the insurgents' ruthless campaign against those who gave information to imperial forces. Indeed, Tegart's main suggestion for combating Irish Republicans was to replicate the approach of the Bengal Police Intelligence Branch down to its system of history sheets and card indices in order to set up what he considered to be a durable and comprehensive system of intelligence. He cautioned that he had no magical solution to British intelligence dilemmas in Ireland, or that because of, quote, my previous experience in India, that I possess some open sesame, some quick and ready method of establishing an intelligence system which will help the authorities deal with problems, end quote. Rather, Tegart emphasized how intelligence successes in Bengal were built upon years of police investigation that enabled officers to build up an intimate understanding of revolutionary networks, what he characterized as, quote, the result of five years plotting and patient investigation, assisted by a large and highly trained office in which all information was carefully and systematically indexed, collated, and pieced together, end quote. This plotting and patient approach, which sought to create an Irish version of the Bengali police archive on revolutionary terrorism, clashed, not surprisingly, with Dublin Castle's desire for agents who would immediately send useful intelligence on the Republican movement. Tegart and Denham, uh, in turn, found the approach of the chief of Irish intelligence and deputy police chief, Colonel Ormond Winter, who was a flamboyant former Indian Army officer, to be amateurish, and their tenure in the Irish administration lasted only four months. 
While Tegart's experiences in Ireland demonstrated the difficulties of replicating intelligence practices across the empire, he achieved greater success in his work for IPI in London and was later offered the position of director of IPI, which he declined, citing his pressing intelligence duties in Bengal. During this time, uh, Tegart, who had a reputation, uh, as previously mentioned, for personally supervising the work of Indian agents, was responsible for agents in Europe who reported on the activities of Indian anti-colonialists. IPI maintained officers in Paris and Geneva through the mid-1920s, and in March 1920, Tegart was able to convince SIS to fund IPI's agent in Geneva, a post-war center of international espionage for 1,500 pounds a year, and in return, quote, get from him all his non-India stuff in exchange, end quote. While European police often considered one of their prime difficulties in anti-colonial surveillance to be the reading of, quote, unquote, inscrutable natives, anti-colonial suspects, the presence of intelligence officers with colonial experience, such as Tegart, held out the promise of making the mysterious and exotic ways of Indians legible. His analyses of the newly established Indian Communist Party made frequent efforts to explain the complicated history and politics of Bengal revolutionaries to an unfamiliar audience, and to make clear their relevance to the actions of transnational revolutionaries, such as M. N. Roy. In August 1922, for example, Tegart noted that the cooperation of former Dhaka Anushyan Samiti, leader Pulin Dash, with Roy was, quote, significant in view of the fact that Pulin Dash has a large party, mainly composed of old members of the Bengal Revolutionary Party under his control in Bengal at the present time, unquote. Tegart was deeply involved with the surveillance of Roy. During 1922 and 23, he authored the majority of IPI's reports on the Indian Communist Party. He also strongly advocated that the British government take action to extradite Roy from Germany, fearing both the contacts he was building with Indian revolutionaries and his sophisticated plans to import communist literature and weapons. In December 1922, Tegart reviewed a lengthy report on Indian revolutionaries prepared by a fellow Indian police officer deputed to IPI. Anxious that all possibilities of action against Roy's organization should be examined carefully, in Tegart's words, Tegart helped arrange a meeting between IPI, SIS, and the special branch of the Metropolitan Police to submit recommendations for action. While Indian office officials initially feared that efforts to extradite Roy would merely cause him to move to Switzerland or Russia, where surveillance would become more difficult, by the summer of 1923, IPI director John Wallinger advocated cooperating with the German police in order to, quote unquote, cause inconvenience for Roy and his wife, Evelyn. During the remainder of the 1920s, thanks in part to Tegart's intervention, the Indian office, the Indian office and British intelligence made more aggressive efforts to harass Roy through cooperation with the French and German police and provided information to the French government, which ultimately led to Roy's expulsion in 1945, sorry, in 1925. Following his retirement from Indian police in 1931, Tegart was involved in another effort to apply Indian intelligence and counterinsurgency expertise elsewhere in the empire. In 1937, he was offered the position of Inspector General of the Palestine Police during the Arab Revolt. He declined and proposed instead that he and former Indian police colleague David Petrie be deputed to study and issue recommendations on improving the police. Petrie was also well-versed in the history of Indian revolutionaries. In addition to supervising Godfrey Denham and other officials in the investigation of the Delhi bombing attack on Lord Harding, he had helped establish an Indian net intelligence network in East Asia during the First World War. Petrie also authored intelligence reports on the Ghadar Party and Indian communism and served as director of the Government of India's Intelligence Bureau from 1924 to 1933. Tegart and Petri form part of a wider circulation of police officers to the Palestinian mandate, or the Palestine mandate, during the interwar period. The British section of the Palestine Gendarmerie, in existence from 1922 to 26, for example, was initially formed almost entirely from members of the disbanded Royal Irish Constabulary and its auxiliary division, a paramilitary force established during the War of Independence. 
nor were Tegard and Petri the first colonial officers to attempt a comprehensive overhaul of the Palestine police. Following a week of riots in 1929, in which Arabs attacked Jewish communities across the mandate, the inspector general of the Salon police force, Herbert Dalbegin, was sent to Palestine at the beginning of the following year to reorganize the police there. In many substantive ways, uh, Tegart and Petri's recommendations significantly diverged from their predecessor. In contrast to his proposals for a failed intelligence mission to Ireland, in which Tegart sought to a great degree to replicate the methods of the Bignal police intelligence branch, in Palestine, his proposals adapted a medley of police methods derived from the Indian police and elsewhere. Tegart and Petri's recommendations rejected Dalbigan's vision of a predominantly civil police force and sought instead to build up the capacity of the police through a frontier force, rural mounted police, and a police strike force to be deployed from headquarters. The most well-known of his recommendations to be implemented was one of the most ambitious security projects to be undertaken anywhere in the British Empire to this point, the construction of a security fence along the Palestinian border with Syria, Syria and Lebanon, and a series of 70 fortified police posts throughout the mandate. Tegart regarded this as the most pressing need in the reorganization of the police and pushed for the fence to be constructed without an open bidding process. The cost was estimated by one source as more than two million pounds. The fortified police stations became known as Tegart forts or simply Tegarts or Tegarts. The colonial office referred to Tegart's proposals as revolutionary, yet in many respects, they repeated lessons of policing that the former police commissioner had learned during his career in India. Tegart and Petri, do par Tegart and Petri drew parallels between the Punjab and the Northwest frontier of India in their analysis of the Palestine revolt and policing solutions for it. The Punjab, as Mark Condos has shown, formed an important resource for British policymakers about anti-colonial insurgency in India and throughout the empire, and the influence of the Punjab was prominent in Tegar and Petri's recommendations for both intelligence work and paramilitary policing. Their recommendations also prominently featured the imperial ideal of the martial races, particularly as manifested in the Punjab and the Northwest frontier. For the staffing of the rural mounted police, a core element of their proposals, the two officers emphasized the, the quote, the tough kind of man, not necessarily literate, who knows as much of the game as the other side, unquote, was required for this, quote, rough class of work, unquote. Indeed, Tegart's recommendations drew not only on policing in the Punjab and India's Northwest frontier, but in insurgent Ireland as well, as measures such as the mounted police and the mobile police striking force shifted the Palestine police back towards the gendarmerie style force that had originally been established in the early 1920s, which large numbers of former, former Irish policemen. Yet Tegart's recommendations for reform in Palestine also incorporated longstanding police practices from Bengal. Tegart drew on his experiences as police commissioner of Calcutta, where his responsibilities were not only with intelligence work, but also with the policing of a large and diverse urban population and issues of organized crime and sectarian disturbances. Other recommendations were based specifically upon intelligence practices in Bengal. Intelligence was at the core of their recommendations. At the very outset of their report, they noted that the CID of the Palestine police was, quote, the Cinderella of the force, and that the force's intelligence capacities needed to be strengthened and reorganized with not simply an increase in personnel, but expert control and properly trained staff. Following the practices of the Bengal Police IB, Tegard and Petri stressed the need both for more secure housing for Palestinian members of the CID and for reassurances to be given to officers that their families would be provided for in case of their death. Both practices were important elements of the intelligence branch's effort to build an elite cadre of Indian intelligence officers. Lastly, the recommendations reflected an important element of Tegart's reputation as an expert opponent of Bengali terrorism, the development of a staff of police watchers. In Petri's judgment, Tegart and Bengal had developed, quote, a highly competent staff of watchers, training them to a degree of efficiency that can but rarely have been attained elsewhere. This reflected both pervasive colonial concerns with surveillance and concrete measures to protect intelligence officers. Tegart and Petri recommended that, 
in their words, a posse of trained Palestinian watchers form part of the new CID. Tegart and Petri regarded all three of these issues, housing, compensation for families, the development of trained staff of watchers as among the reforms, uh, quote, demanding the immediate intention of the government. While Tegart envisioned a transition from the Arab insurgency to a turn to what within the colonial context might be considered ordinary policing, the policing methods which he introduced in the effort to suppress the revolt introduced a new wave of brutal, brutal treatment of suspected insurgents. The use of collective fines for villages was deployed in Bengal in the 1930s in order to de deprive revolutionaries in Chittagong of the assistance of the local population. In Palestine, Charles Tegart strongly advocated the separation of Arab villages into good and bad settlements and the levying of collective fines and punishments in order to deprive insurgents of support. He arranged the importation of Doberman dogs from South Africa for the purpose of terrorist tracking and established a center in Jerusalem to train police and military in interrogation techniques. Suspected insurgents were subjected to humiliation and physical torture. The water can method, which involved the pouring of water into a prostrate and restrained subject's nostrils, was considered preferable to beatings because it left no evidence of mistreatment. So let me conclude. For both Abdul Rashid and Sir Charles Tegart, the legacies of their engagements with empire in the interwar era proved enduring. Hugo Espinosa's return to the United States seems to have ended his career as a revolutionary, if he ever was one. His name does not appear on the lists of Indian extremists in the United States or other intelligence correspondence that I have been able to trace. Abdul Rashid, as he was now known, settled in New York City, worked as a clerk in his brother's tobacco business, married and raised a family. Not surprisingly, his bitterness towards the British Empire lingered. Family members recall him constantly typing in his room, though none of his papers seemed to remain. His son recalled a fragment of a poem he wrote in which he referred to the British in a memorable line as the perfidious albino. Ultimately, it was Abdul Rashid's faith and identity as a Muslim that proved most enduring following his return to the United States. His Hungarian-born wife converted to Islam, and in 1956, he was able to achieve the ambition that he had harbored since his time in detention in Bengal three decades earlier. Accompanied by his son, Amir, he was able to make the pilgrimage to the Hajj. For Tegart, not surprisingly, his intelligence experience against Bengali revolutionaries continued to shape his imperial service during the Second World War. In the summer of 1940, he was recruited by another former Indian police officer Deputy Chief of SIS Valentine Vivian to deliver reports on the status of Irish neutrality. Tegart's rather alarmist, rather alarmist and exaggerated reports of German IRA collaboration gained the attention of the British War Cabinet and for a time had an important influence on British policy towards ERA. He was subsequently considered for the position of Special Advisor to the Special Operations Executive, newly established Indian section, but rejected because of poor health. Instead, Tegart was in 1942 appointed head of the Ministry of Foods newly created Central, Intel, sorry, Central Enforcement Intelligence Bureau in order to better identify, monitor, and prosecute black marketeers in Britain. Tegart's imperial policing experience enhanced his position as a police liaison there. His, quote, reputation as a counterterrorism expert built up over his 25 year career in the Indian police, enabled him to forge links with senior figures in the Metropolitan Police and the security services. Indeed, Tegart made the Central Enforcement Intelligence Bureau of the Ministry of Food into an enclave of colonial policing as he recruited a number of police colleagues with experience in the anti-revolutionary campaign in Bengal. I have no evidence that Charles Tegard and Hugo Espinosa slash Abdul Rashid ever met, though I admit I am intrigued by the possibility that Tegard might have visited Espinosa while he was detained in Calcutta to grill him for information about the doings of M.N. Roy and Rosh Bihari Bose. In general terms, the lives of both individuals illustrate Tony Ballantyne's formulation of empire, not as a spoke from metropole to colony, but rather as, quote, a complex web consisting of filaments that run along various colonies in addition to vertical connections between metropole and individual colonies. And one might add 
how these networks and connections also extended beyond the empire's borders. More specifically, the revolutionary networks of Hugo Espinosa and the imperial policing of Charles Tegart prompt us to reevaluate our understanding of the interwar era. The intelligence campaign against the Bengali revolutionaries helps us to better understand how colonial practices, ideologies, and personnel continue to shape British intelligence and counterinsurgency in the post-war era. Imperial intelligence networks at times linked metropolitan empire, at other times were cross-colonial, and at still other times extended beyond the empire's borders. The same is true of the activities of anti-colonial revolutionaries, who, as they continued to combine nationalist and internationalist visions, were to challenge the empire even more forcefully following the Second World War. Thank you.